So, our first presenter, I'm very pleased to introduce Dr. Laurie Wilkinson, who is a professor in the Department of Sociology at the University of Manitoba. She specializes in immigration and refugee studies, particularly on issues related to discrimination, settlement, and health among newcomers to Canada. She is currently the editor of the Journal of International Migration and Integration and, as mentioned earlier, the Executive Director of Immigration Research West, which is an academic and community think tank concerned with issues related to successful settlement and integration. So please join in welcoming Laurie, Dr. Laurie Wilkinson in her presentation in regards to um, why don't immigrants to BC feel more at home? So let's welcome Laurie Wilkinson. Thank you very, very much for um, the kind invitation to come here, um, especially to Marion and Katie and Bahar for their help in uh, putting this together. Um, uh, I've, I'm very grateful. Um, so I, what I'm going to do today is I'm going to share with you some data that um, I've been working with in terms of settlement issues, uh, sense of belonging, and if I have enough time, talk about uh, labor market um, outcomes amongst immigrants in Western Canada, but with a special focus on BC. Um, and although I've got lots of data for you, um, and I've got some opinions about how we understand this data, um, I'm hoping that I can get some ideas from you because I don't think I have all the answers when it comes to interpreting this stuff. So um, uh, any kinds of comments, suggestions, or questions you have, I very much welcome them. Um, so uh, this past year, uh, I was tasked uh, from uh, a nice grant that we received from Citizenship and Immigration Canada uh, to look at the settlement experiences of immigrants to Western Canada. And um, uh, basically, the objective of, of the entire project was to look at a whole bunch of different data sets. And if I could find one trend in one data set, would I be able to find it in another one, and maybe a third one, and maybe a fourth one? Because if we can find similar trends in data across different sets of data, we can feel a bit more confident about the findings, but also feel a bit more confident about directing um, our attention to creating new pro programming to uh, assist people who are having difficulty. Um, so that was the point of the entire project. Um, it's big. Um, I'm probably looking at about 550 pages of this final report when I'm done. Um, so that's what I say when I have a lot of data to share. I have a ton of data to share and just not enough time to share it with you. But um, I picked, hopefully I picked out some things that are of interest to the audience today. So what data do I have? I have some very special data. Um, data that um, only four of the, pr of the five data sets that I have are, um, uh, are only available to me and a handful of other people. Um, and only other, one of them is, is publicly uh, available. So that's special in and of itself. But from a statistical standpoint, these are really neat data sets. Um, for the data gurus out there, they're simple random samples of, of immigrants to Canada. All except one, which is the IMDB, which is actually a census. Um, and so the IMDB actually takes the landing records file for immigrants, and hooks it up with the um, tax records file. Um, so if you've arrived in Canada anytime between 1980 and 2012, I've got your data. <laughs> Well, I, I can't pick you out, um, and I will treat it respectfully. Um, <laughs> but it's a very powerful a set tool to look at um, labor market outcomes at, over a period of time. The other four data sets are simple random samples of immigrants who arrived to Canada, um, mainly um, since 2008, between 2008 and 2012. Um, and you don't get random samples very much anymore. Um, and so for, for the statisticians out there, this is a big win. Um, but for us, it just simply means that it's a very good 
set of data um, that we have. The Pan-Canadian Settlement Survey uh, was conducted by the BC government uh, in 2012, um, and it includes 20,000 people from across Canada. The Western Canadian Settlement Survey was a group of us uh, in the West um, who uh, surveyed 3,000 immigrants uh, last year over a period of three weeks. Um, and the Alberta Settlement Survey uh, was a, a study of 1,000 Alberta immigrants, which I won't be talking to you today about, um, but again, it was use a simple random sample. Um, the other data set which I don't use very much um, because it's a bit older is the Longitudinal Survey of Immigrants to Canada and that's publicly available. It's an awesome data set. Um, they interviewed immigrants six months, tw two years and four years after their arrival. Uh, so very interesting longitudinal findings there. The problem is, is it's 10 years old now. Um, so it kind of gives us a historical record and so I just use it um, as, as something that I can refer to, like is it something that we saw 10 years ago or is this, is this something different? Um, so most of you are familiar with the number of immigrants coming to British Columbia, but I always find that this table's uh, illustrative uh, for everyone. Um, most of you probably know that the number of immigrants coming to British Columbia is declining. Um, mainly it's because your number one um, immigrant group is the family class, which is the one that's um, being affected by uh, the uh, focus on economic migrants. So it, you'll see that the blue line at the top is the numbers to BC, which is going down a little bit. Um, but the numbers to Saskatchewan and um, Alberta are going up. Numbers to uh, uh, Manitoba are going down as well. And um, People maybe not who don't live in the Western region don't realize the influence that immigrants have uh, on our society. Um, but everybody can, um, I guess, relate to this statement. Um, immigrants in the prairies in British Columbia account for more than half of the employment and economic growth in the entire country. So if you don't care about what happens to immigrants in the West, if you care from a money perspective, this is a group of people we should be paying attention to. I care about them more than just money, uh, which is what we'll get to uh, in a few moments. But um, uh, it just, uh, I feel like every time I, I give this uh, talk to people outside of, of the Western region, they, th they think, well, why should we care? Like, shouldn't this just be on Ontario immigrants, for instance? Well, um, this is precisely why, um, if you want an economic argument. So uh, who immigrates to British Columbia? And I think, you know, out of most of the prairie provinces in the Western region, um, people living in British Columbia have a good handle on who comes to British Columbia. So um, I'm not going to talk too much about this data, except to say um, that um, the kind of people who come to BC are very different than the people who go to other provinces. If we look at um, immigrants by their entrance class, 39% uh, of the people who come to BC are in the uh, family class, and that's uh, higher than the Canadian average. The Canadian average is around 25 to 30%. Um, so that the, the flavor of, of immigrants here are, are a bit different in terms of their economic class, or their um, entrance class. The economic class is a little bit smaller, and the refugee class is a little bit smaller here too. Um, not surprisingly, the source area that immigrants come from um, who are moving to BC, a little bit different than the rest of Canada, um, where uh, the, there's a heavy emphasis on um, migration from the Asian Pacific region um, coming to this uh, area, and m much fewer people from Africa and the Middle East uh, coming. But I think one of the things that we fail to talk about is this little number here. Whoops, <laughs> there we go, I knew that was going to happen. Um, in BC, the number of people who can't speak one of Canada's official languages is the highest in the country. So um, basically four out of every 10 who comes to Canada um, can't speak English or French at, on arrival. Um, and if you think about new immigration rules that emphasize knowledge of English or French prior to arrival, um, this is gonna have some real effect on future migration to BC too. I, I think you'll, you're gonna see this number go down, but you also might see the number of people coming to BC going down as a result of that. Um, and most of you are familiar with where uh, immigrants go to in British Columbia. This is kind of a scary table, but um, here's the region, and this is the percentage of immigrants by place. So for Vancouver, 
40% uh, of the population of Greater Vancouver is, is, is immigrant. Um, but there's some interesting things here too. Victoria, Fraser Valley, uh, just over 20% of the population um, is, uh, was not born here. So again, a, a very different kind of flavor to immigration here uh, than in other places in Canada. So who are the people that we're talking about today? Um, we've, uh, I, I chose a few demographic uh, things to share with you, um, but to make a point actually about how we did this data analysis. So um, uh, economic migrants in BC typically make up about 55% of your population, um, but in our sample, they only make up 40%. So what we did is to try to correct for that under sampling of, of economic migrants um, is to uh, uh, weight the data. So uh, we, I can tell you how we did it um, in the question and answer if you're interested. But we, we applied a statistical correction to make sure that we had the right number of economic immigrants for BC, the right number of family class uh, immigrants for BC because we've um, we've uh, undersampled that group. Sorry, the family classes, we've oversampled family. No, actually, we're on target for family because it's 39% we undersampled uh, for economic classes um, and for refugees. So we made a correction uh, in our data uh, to account for that and some of the other over and under representation. So women were overrepresented. We, um, we made a correction for that too. So here's the juicy bits. <laughs> I'm going to start off talking about um, settlement use. Um, so uh, in the Pan-Canadian and the Western Canadian and the Alberta survey, which I won't talk about today, um, there is a series of questions about did you access services, how did you access service, where did you get at service from. Uh, we looked at differences along sex, immigration class, provincial lines, where you lived, uh, that sort of thing. So it's a gold mine. Of, of data um, on, on settlement service use. And so I'm gonna show, this is my favorite table and something that my students are working on right now. This is um, settlement use of, uh, settlement service use by province of residence. And so what's interesting here is that um, this, this row here is yes, I accessed services. Um, whoops. And this gets people a little bit worried um, because you would think, and I would think too, that an awful lot more people use services. But it's this row here that I think is the most interesting. This is a group of people who did not access services, but said they needed them. So I've got a little bit of information about why they didn't access services, but for BC, 31% of the people who came here, and this is within a five-year period, said they needed services but couldn't get them for one reason or another. Um, it's about middle of the pack for the Prairie region. Um, Alberta is the worst, um, almost 40% in terms of that measure. Um, and so what I've, I'm sad, I can't share a whole lot of information about this group, um, but we're looking at who are these people, what's their gender, what's their entrance class, can they speak English, and so I'm going to touch on a little bit on that um, uh, right now. Um, not surprisingly, um, access to services is easier in the big cities. So by urban centers, I mean places where there's over 10,000 people. So uh, that means your bigger centers like Kamloops, Kelowna, Victoria, those sorts of places. Um, so the blue bars are, are urban uh, access at 37%. Oh. Um, and... Uh, uh, in, in Manitoba, 43% uh, of the people who live in urban centers, which is basically uh, Winnipeg and Brandon, um, are more likely to access services. Um, the, the rural bar is a little bit more um, disturbing um, at 12% um, accessing services versus 26 and 39%. Um, and so th this, is, this is the kind of stuff that we're working on. Um, of the people who did access services, this is from the Pan-Canadian uh, Settlement Survey, um, they were asked how satisfied they were with the services that they received. Um, the province that scores highest is Saskatchewan, Manitoba, and good grief, now what did I do? Uh, and I don't have a computer here. Alex! <laughs> Alex only has one hand. How is he going to fix it? <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> I keep pressing the, the, the uh, laser key is right next to the explode key on the computer. So 
Um, so, um, th so the three provinces where immigrants are most satisfied with settlement services are uh, Saskatchewan, uh, Manitoba, and Newfoundland. Um, in uh, British Columbia, um, they have some of the lowest satisfaction with services. Um, and I'm not sure why that is. Um, and uh, it could be something that we want to look into uh, in the future. Now, we wanted to um, understand how language might be a barrier to accessing services. And um, I think to a certain extent it is. But I do want to warn you, any measure of language ability in a survey is probably very flawed. Um, people tend to overestimate their ability to speak a language or they underestimate it. And I don't know if there's more people who overestimate or more people who underestimate. <laughs> um, so it's a very imprecise measure of, of language fluency. Um, that said, um, it is in the direction that we would think um, that it would be. That is, people who um, have difficulty speaking English, in this case, in, in British Columbia, um, are more likely to access services. I think that's the, the, the direction we'd expect things uh, to flow. Um, but I, th I think it's very interesting that um, if we look at the people who have poor language ability, um, almost half of them uh, uh, don't access services. Um, so language could really be a barrier um, to accessing services. Uh, maybe it's difficult to get information to that group of people, uh, or maybe they're not, they're far away um, from these services, I'm not sure. Um, so I would say that this is a finding, but it's a finding that maybe we should not put a lot of faith into, uh, simply because the measurement of English language ability is a bit difficult. It's a pretty good measure. It's not just how well do you speak English. It's a combination of speaking, reading, writing, understanding, listening to, um, being able to perform in a conversation. So there's lots of questions in there. Um, and it's got lots of statistical validity. But from a face validity standpoint, maybe not so much. Um, but this finding is also uh, corroborates finding in this table. And the question that was posed in the Pan-Canadian Settlement Survey was, if you were having difficulty finding a job, would you know where to get help? Um, and in BC, things aren't so good, uh, sadly. Um, these folks over here, 55% uh, of males and 48% of females knew where to go to get help to find a job. Um, but those are amongst the lowest in the country. Um, the only other province that's lower is uh, Prince Edward Island. So here's some interesting things, and this is where my um, students are focusing their work right now, is people who didn't access services, why they didn't access services. Um, and about half of people who don't access services say they don't need help. So um, my students are working on a series of questions about where you got help settling, you know, did your friends help you, did family help you, what kind of help did they get you? Um, so this is the kind of thing that they're working on right now. Um, but if you look at, um, at the data by province, um, the, uh, the number one reason for not accessing services is simply, I didn't need any help. And I think that's a kind of interesting statement because um, I think that some people, especially researchers, they like to think that immigrants are helpless. You know, they move to BC and they think, oh my goodness, like what do I do? I don't know how to get a job. I don't know how to go to the grocery store. And people aren't like that, right? And especially immigrants aren't like that either, right? I mean, it takes a lot of guts and determination and probably a little bit of luck to get out of your country of origin. Um, you're, you're definitely one of those A-type personalities. So um, to me, it's not surprising that a lot of people say, well, I didn't need help because I found it on my own. Um, and so um, for BC, that accounts, oh, jeepers, Alex. <laughs> it's, it, you know what it is, <laughs> it's, it's the laser pointer. <laughs> and I'm all thumbs, apparently. <laughs> Sorry about that. So um, I, think it, I think it's a measure of resiliency and independence, too, that I think we need to, to focus on. But we still have you know, half of that group who didn't access services. Why didn't they access services? And this is where things get a bit interesting. Um, so uh, uh, many people said it was because they didn't have information um, about services that were available. Um, now, British Columbia um, is the best measure. So there was fewer people in British Columbia who said that. 
It's still the number one reason for not accessing services. That accounts for 18% of the people who didn't access services. Um, if there was confusion, like, I don't know where I can go to get help. This place says they'll help me. This other place says they'll help me. This place says I'm not eligible for help. So um, this accounts for 9.8% of the British Columbia uh, sample. Um, and then another 7.6% said that they lacked services in their community. And so Mew's going to talk a little bit about um, accessing services in rural centers. Um, but I think some of, the, some of these people probably don't realize that there's help. Uh, for you in these communities. I've got Saskatchewan sticking out here. Um, Saskatchewan's kind of an interesting place. They went from less than 2,000 immigrants per year um, in six years to 10,000 immigrants per year. Um, so uh, they've got a different set of problems around confusion and trying to set up services, that sort of thing. Um, so that makes it kind of interesting from, from that standpoint. Um, Another way of looking at access to services is are you uh, is is the group of people who are having difficulty finding a job. And um, the uh, cell that I want you to look at is this bright yellow one here. So 28% of people who have difficulty finding a job um, at, uh, did not access services. So again, a group of people who probably could use um, service help, but for one reason or another are not getting it. So this is the group that we're looking at more, um, more in detail, and I'm actually hoping to have the service use section of my report done before the uh, holiday break, so um, hopefully I'll have some answers for that. But I also welcome your um, ideas on this too. Um, this table shows um, the services most needed after arrival. So we asked a whole bunch of questions about what kinds of services do you need, um, and, it, and if you could only have one service, just one, what would it be? And across Canada, um, by a large margin, it's um, employment services. So um, ask any immigrant in any province, and you have a 50% chance of them saying, it's, I need help with employment issues. Um, for BC, that number isn't as high, um, but it's still the number one service uh, request. So here's, here's the service requests for um, immigrants in BC, and I apologize, that top number should read 46.8. I've been burning the candle at both ends for a few months now. <laughs> um, and, but it's still the number one service request amongst uh, immigrants. Um, if, you, um, if you look at the other kinds of service requests, number two is supportive counseling. That means um, just having a settlement worker that you can talk to to find out where you can get help or what organization you can get help with. So kind of that personalized uh, settlement help. Um, that's number two for your province. Um, and the only other place where um, people even mention that in the top, well, even the top 10 um, is Saskatchewan, actually. So um, there's a feeling here that um, more supportive counseling would be needed. Um, health and wellness usually comes out as number two. Um, across Canada. Um, it's number four for you guys. Um, English language assessment um, is, is, is small. Um, we were a bit surprised about that, but maybe people figure that they can learn English uh, on their own. So now I'm going to talk a little bit about um, sense of belonging, which is probably why I'm here, um, because I shared some tables with you uh, back in, um, I guess it was the beginning of November, um, which showed that um, immigrants in British Columbia weren't feeling like they fit in uh, very well. And um, sociologists and academics, uh, you know, are very concerned, have been concerned about sense of belonging for a long, long time, uh, well since into the 1930s, actually, uh, where um, social scientists had done experiments around um, how newcomers, particularly from Poland and the Ukraine, um, uh, fit in in the United States and in Canada. Um, but if, even if we dig farther back into academic theory and academic discussion, um, we have this term called anami. Um, if you took uh, sociology in, in, in school, you'll learn uh, anami is a concept that was developed by Emile Durkheim, which who is 
kind of the father of, of sociology. Um, but I think uh, it applies a little bit to the way we live our, our lives today, and in particular, some of this data that I'm seeing about sense of belonging, uh, particularly in BC. And what anime means is, um, is a breakdown of social bonds between an individual and the community, which results in a fragmentation of social identity and a re rejection of self-regulatory values. So we'll strip away all that jargon, and basically what it means is that people who have anomi don't feel like they fit in. They feel like they're not part of the crowd, that people don't respect them, that don't understand them, and that their life isn't very meaningful. And this is kind of a scary thing. Um, if you feel like you're not meaningful, life has no meaning, um, you're less likely to contribute to voluntary associations, community associations. For immigrants, you're less likely to feel like you're Canadian. Um, you might feel depressed, lonely. Um, and if you're feeling that way, maybe your spouse feels that way, or maybe your spouse feels that way because you're feeling that way, maybe your children feel that way. Um, so anime is something that you can catch from other people around you, not in the disease kind of sense, but you pick up on it. If the people around you are feeling lonely and they don't fit in, it's a, it's a pretty dangerous thing. And um, so when I gave a speech in November, um, a bunch of people gave me some really good information and reports that kind of corroborate the sense of anime, particularly in Vancouver, um, but um, I think in general in society, and not just immigrants, um, the way we live our lives today uh, tends to be very fragmented and lonely. Sure, we might have a thousand Facebook friends, but those friends are kind of fake, right? And I think this is kind of what we're seeing in the immigration data that I'm going to share with you. Um, but um, I think there's other issues connected to anime that are highly important. And um, just the other day, I picked up a paper um, by Abdi Kazamipur and, and Reza Nakai, um, who linked bad economic experiences. So if you have trouble integrating into the labor market, um, there's a very big chance that you're going to feel like you don't fit in in, in society as well. And this is precisely what I'm seeing in the data for BC. Um, but I'm seeing this across Canada too. It just seems like the trend is a bit more predominant in BC. So I'm going to share with you some, some of these findings. Um, so I think this is the table that got um, people um, sweating uh, in the audience. Um, and so we measured sense of belonging with a whole big series of questions. So we, we turned them into one number. It's a, it's a more valid way of, of looking at sense of belonging. So we looked at, um, do you feel like you belong in your community, your city, your province, your country? Um, do you feel like you fit in um, with the people who are around you in your school and your work, that sort of thing? So we put them together into a single measure called sense of belonging. Um, and um, the thing I want to point out is, is that still, two out of three people who live in BC still feel like they belong. So that's good, uh, just not as good as everywhere else, where you're looking at 80% in Alberta and Saskatchewan, um, and about three and four in Manitoba. Um, but this, this group uh, really tends to stick out. Um, and so this is the big question that I've been having is why, and who are these people? Well, it turns out they're women, um, so if you look at the differences between men across province, across um, immigrant entrance class, across all kinds of different measures, men, doesn't matter who they are, where they live, where they come from, they all have the same. And their, their sense of belonging is higher than it is for women. If you look at women, there's some interesting differences. So um, where you live really matters for a woman. Um, they score the lowest in, in BC. Um, so uh, still two-thirds feel like they have a strong sense of belonging, um, but it's still uh, significantly different than the other provinces. They also tend to live in big places, so um, places over 10,000 people. Um, so this number is smaller than all of these other numbers. Um, they tend to be a lot happier in the rural areas, and that's a pattern we see across the, the region. Um, again, I think because you get to know people's names and you can't ignore them. <laughs> um, I think that's uh, one of the reasons that this happens. Um, but, um, you know, friendly Manitoba, for instance, isn't too far behind you guys either, right? Especially in Winnipeg and Brandon, right? So um, I know <laughs> I've talked to so many people about this data and, and they all want to know, 
is where is my province number one? Where are we the best? And so, you know, Alberta wants to be the best at this, and Saskatchewan wants to be the best at that. And well, it's the same thing in Manitoba. It's like, oh, you know, we know everything about immigration. <laughs> I just like to point out to them, this ain't so good either. Um, so, uh, um, so, so you've got an urban and a rural uh, dimension to sense of belonging, where in general, people who live in, in rural areas feel feel like they belong a bit more than people who live in rural area or urban areas um, and and in BC um, uh, that pattern sticks sorry this table's a little scary this is looking at the effect of your entrance class on your sense of belonging um, and again this is where the BC data tends to be not as strong as the other provinces particularly right here with the family class. They're less likely to feel like um, they, they uh, belong uh, than, than other groups, but it's still lagging behind in all the other categories, except for refugees where um, Manitoba, where I live right now, um, who like to think they, they know a lot about refugee uh, resettlement, or they're scoring the worst, actually. Um, here's another scary table. We're gonna switch gears here, actually, because one of the other sets of questions were, have you been discriminated against and, and how have you been discriminated against? So again, a series of questions that ask about your experience of discrimination. And to me, I would think that if you have a strong sense of, of being discriminated against, your sense of belonging is going to be lower, right? If you feel like people are, are discriminating against you because of your gender, your ethnicity, your religion, you're probably not gonna feel like you fit in. This is where things get weird for BC um, because the discrimination scores are the best in BC. In other words, the rates of discrimination, at least in the three data sets that I have, uh, indicate that um, there's way less discrimination in British Columbia than any of the other provinces. And if you look here, this is for males, this bar here, 80% um, of males in BC said they've never experienced discrimination. You look at the prairie provinces here, like Alberta, Saskatchewan, Manitoba, I mean, that's a pretty big difference um, right there. Same thing for women, like look at this difference here between Alberta and BC. Um, so women in Alberta very much feeling like they don't, that they're being discriminated against. And so this is where I'm having some, some difficulty trying to put this all together, right? So you have a, a, a strong sense that discrimination isn't happening, or at least on, on, a, on, a, on the same scale as it is elsewhere. But you also have a group of people who are feeling like they don't fit in. Um, and, and this data isn't fitting together well, so I welcome any, any of your thoughts on this. This is um, discrimination rates based on your um, entrance class. Um, so this one is for economic class. Um, they're the... Um, 78% of those living in BC uh, who came as an economic immigrant have never experienced discrimination. That's the, that's the best uh, score across the provinces. Um, and this green bar here is for family class. Um, that is basically the best across the prairie provinces too. Um, with look at this for Alberta. Almost half of, of the Alberta family class immigrants have, have uh, felt discrimination of some sort. So, um, so I, I got to thinking about, you know, what is the connection between discrimination and, and, and um, sense of belonging? And, you know, maybe they aren't connected at all, um, which is also um, uh, a possibility. Um, but um, I wanted to make sure that the data that we were seeing, particularly in the pan-Canadian and the Western Canadian settlement surveys, that there wasn't something about that data that was wrong. Um, so I looked to other places to kind of corroborate the information. So um, I'm getting kind of similar measures. So um, except for one, um, and it's this last one here. So it's almost like I planned this. Because uh, this fall, um, there was three major studies of, of discrimination that were conducted across Canada. And they were all national studies. Um, and so they would find things like... Um, 55% uh, of immigrants or people in Canada agree that immigrants are very important to building a stable Canadian economic future. Almost 80% are comfortable uh, working with someone from a different ethnic background. But then you've got some of these things here, right? 30% um, of Canadians think that immigrants take jobs away from them. Um, but it's this thing here, um, and this is from a recent CBC poll, 
where it says that 81% of Brit British Columbians of, of Chinese and South Asian descent report that they've experienced some kind of discrimination. Um, and they asked their questions a bit differently than we did. So um, I'm wondering if that might be a reason why the discrimination questions aren't, um, aren't working out as well. Do I have time to do some labor market stuff? Okay, so we're gonna switch some gears and talk about labor market issues um, uh, in, uh, br amongst uh, British Columbia immigrants, also using the same data sets. And the first table I'm gonna show you totally freaks out the Saskatchewan government, because <laughs> this is the unemployment rate by entrance class. And uh, holy cow, 28% of refugees in Saskatchewan are unemployed. Um, and this is probably the only measure of unemployment by immigration class that's available. Um, annual labor force survey asks if you were born outside of Canada, but it doesn't ask you how you got here. Um, so some really interesting data on, on unemployment rate. Um, for BC, the unemployment rates are a little bit higher. Um, f for skilled worker and professionals, it's 14%. Uh, which is the highest in the Western provinces. Um, amongst provincial nominees, it's 13%, also the highest. Um, and amongst refugees, it's basically one in five um, are unemployed. So not so rosy figures. But again, I wanted to make sure that we were on the right track. And if you look at the annual labor force survey um, data by province for immigrants, um, it, the, the global um, unemployment rate is almost the same. So, so I feel fairly confident that these are um, uh, pretty good measures of unemployment. We wanted to look at what are the factors that influence a person having a job. So um, I did something called a logistic regression, which I'm happy to talk to you about the, the methodology behind that. Um, in the question and answer, but basically it's, it's a statistical uh, procedure that allows us to look at the influence of a whole bunch of things at the same time. So in this case, we're looking at what are the, what are the factors that influence the, uh, the chances of a person having a job? And so we did this for each province. Um, so this yellow bar here for sex, that means that uh, men in BC are three times more likely to be working than women kind of makes sense to me because of the number of family class uh, migrants here. Um, that's the greatest influence across the four western provinces. Um, not surprising because of the, um, the importance of the family class here. Um, this is a bit interesting. Um, if you've been educated in Canada, and there's a whole bunch of labor market literature on this, um, you're more likely in fact, 1.5 times more likely to be working in British Columbia than you are uh, if your highest level of education is outside of Canada. So the idea is, is well, you can't get a job because you don't have Canadian education, and so the the labor market is discriminating against you because you have you don't have Canadian credentials, and that seems to work for BC. I don't know why it's like this for Manitoba, Saskatchewan, and Alberta, because basically what it's saying is, is that if you have Canadian education, you're less likely to be working. <laughs> uh, so, But I think it has to do with the labor market there, because if you look closely at the data for, especially for Alberta and Saskatchewan, I mean, those are our, our booming economies right now. And uh, what you're finding is, is that there's an awful lot of overqualified people working in jobs there. Um, so I think that's what that's speaking to. Um, English language ability, again, right? Not the best measure, but it's still... It's still in the direction. <laughs> I fail. <laughs> I got Alex twitching, poor guy. <laughs> um, if you can speak English, you're 1.7 times more likely to be employed. Um, this is a big influence in Alberta. Um, uh, so, so kind of interesting. It doesn't matter how long you've been in, in Canada, it's not gonna affect your employment here. Um, but if you came as an economic class, you're 3.5 times more likely to be working. Um, and the good news here is, is that it doesn't matter if you're a racialized minority, um, it has no effect on your ability to get a job. The only place it does is in Saskatchewan. Um, and so they were, upset about that, but also um, the government people that I spoke to said that they've got all kinds of evidence to suggest that there's a lot of um, uh, ethnic discrimination in the labor market there. There's also a series of questions about um, foreign credential recognition, which I think are, are hugely interesting for us to talk about um, in the time that I have left. Um, and so one question that was posed by the um, 
this would be the Western Canadian Settlement Survey, was how difficult has it been for you to find a job that matches your skills? And in Saskatchewan, it's a huge problem. Um, you know, almost 50% of the skilled workers feel like they're, they're overqualified for their job. Um, one in three family class workers feel like they're overqualified for their job. BC things aren't looking as grim, um, but still you've got one in four um, skilled workers feeling overqualified for their job, one in four family class, 18% um, of refugees. Um, so uh, uh, kind of an interesting personal perception about this. But um, we wanted to dig into this a little bit further. So um, we're looking at something called job status increase or job status decrease. And so what we did is we took um, data from your last job that you held before you came to Canada and compared it with your current job in Canada. And what we did is we categorized them into the national occupation codes. I can answer questions about that later, but essentially um, it allows us to separate jobs that require, say, a university level education, you know, like your physicians, your accountants, that kind of group, uh, compare them to the people who need vocational training, like plumbers, auto mechanics, um, that group of people, to the people who have jobs that you only need high school education for, versus the people who have jobs where you require no education. And so this table um, shows um, the percentage of people who have better jobs, the same jobs, or worse jobs. The good news is, is it doesn't matter what province you live in. Um, if you live in BC, you're 53% um, likely to uh, have a job decline. In other words, that you're working at a job that, that you're overqualified for. And that's a trend that uh, goes across all of the four western provinces. And as far as I can tell, I can't quite test this with the, um, the entire um, country yet, but it seems like it's a pattern that follows across Canada. Um, there's some good news here though. 23% um, of immigrants who live in, in British Columbia actually have better jobs now than the jobs in which they left. Um, so, um, so there is some room for upward movement, but for the most part, on average, most people see a decline in their job status. But it just doesn't matter what province you live in. So here's the job status decline or increase um, by your entrance class. Um, and so uh, again, um, this poses a lot of questions uh, for us. Um, refugees, not surprisingly, have the most difficult time finding a job that matches their prior qualification, and that makes sense. Um, it's hard to track down um, proof that you've had a particular education, especially if your institution no longer exists. Uh, one of the things that um, governments like to do is destroy that kind of stuff when there's a war. So um, I'm not surprised that the rates of job mismatch and skill mismatch for refugees are high. Um, they're highest in Saskatchewan. That's All the blue bars are, are the job declines, so at 75%. Um, for Saskatchewan, so 75% of refugees um, have uh, jobs which are lower in status uh, than what they left. For BC, um, it's still two and three, um, but it's a pattern that pretty much fits across all of the provinces. If you look at the skilled worker and professional class, things are a little bit better in BC than everywhere else. Um, there's fewer people who have status decline uh, in this category than the other three provinces. Um, and in fact, a third have an equivalent job here um, as they did when they left. This the provincial nominees group um, that causes a lot of discussion with, with government people um, because these, this is a group of people that has arranged employment. Um, and the interesting thing for BC is half of the people in this class, which is the best in Canada, have an equivalent job here as to when they left. So um, better job mis better job match and skill match uh, than in other provinces. Um, but uh, And in fact, one in four are actually in better jobs. And this is kind of a trend you see across all the other provinces too. Um, there's no statistically significant provincial differences amongst the family class group. Um, they're basically working at jobs that are similar to jobs that they left, if they were working. Um, but uh, this table tends to get a lot of, of government discussion. So um, what does the research have to say about um, labor market outcomes amongst immigrants? Um, there's two major debates. Um, 
uh, that academics have, um, but they all agree that the transferability of skills across um, countries isn't very good, and it seems to be getting worse. And it's a, a trend that you see in Canada, the United States, New Zealand, Australia. Um, so, so we can all agree on that. What we don't agree on is why this is happening. So some um, academics seem to think that the immigrants that are moving today have lower language skills, lower quality education, and not as good job networks. I'm not willing to believe that as an explanation for a couple of reasons. One is, is that in Canada, the language, the points you get for language um, are actually more now. It's tougher to get into Canada if you don't have good language skills than it used to be. Um, the other issue with languages is, as I mentioned to you before, any um, personal measure of language ability isn't very trustworthy. So, um, you know, we can't really tell if it, it really is true that people are, are having worse language skills. The lower quality education explanation also doesn't hold a lot of weight, in my humble opinion. And that's because we don't have rankings of institutions, not even for our own country, right? I mean, we know uh, in Canada, yes, um, most, uh, all schools are, are, are government regulated, but there's some are better than others. Some have better um, reputations, better job outcomes for their, for their graduates. We don't have that information. And to, the, to my knowledge, there's absolutely no data set on this planet that ranks schools and includes that in, in a measure of immigrant success. So I don't think that you can call lower quality education uh, an issue because we don't have proof of that. Um, so people like to say, well, if you've got education, say, from China, um, maybe it's not as good as the education you get in Canada. Well, that's not true. I mean, some of the best universities on the planet are in China. So we, we, can't, we can't measure that. So I don't think that either of these are a viable explanation. The good job networks, though, um, we can measure, and I think there is some evidence to suggest that immigrants have um, less strong, less small, or smaller uh, networks. It causes them to have difficulty to find work. The other group of people um, argue that um, it's not those things that cause labor market decline right now. It's um, labor market discrimination. Um, and they can quantify that. Um, you know, 17% of, of labor market discrimination is based on ethnicity in the latest uh, paper that I saw from Statistics Canada. The problem with that is, again, like some of these measurements are, are not as valid. Um, so I think that there's evidence to suggest that this happens. We just don't know the extent to which it does happen. So for me, I think the two arguments, we don't have enough evidence to say, yes, this is what's really happening and this is why it's happening. But, um, but this, is, this is how academics have tackled the issue. Um, but I think the other point that I want to make to you is that um, people tend to believe that immigrants migrate only for jobs, and that's so wrong. Um, there are many non-economic uh, non reasons for migration, even amongst the people who are coming in as economic migrants. Um, and I think the other issue is, is that um, a the research doesn't take into account um, the fact that newcomers don't have full knowledge of the labor markets in which they're entering. So um, some research even um, uh, out of uh, UBC actually has looked at um, uh, you know, how immigrants are sold the immigration experience and, and, and how um, you know, some of these recruiters are breaking rules and laws to encourage people to come here and promising them citizenship when in fact that doesn't happen. So I think a lot of these things, you know, the, especially the people who work on economic issues, they like to think that they have all of the answers, but uh, to me there's, there's big holes in all of their arguments. So what else can we say about a uh, sense of belonging and discrimination to kind of go back to the, the, the beginning part of the talk? Um, so we have on one hand immigrants coming to BC having the lowest sense of belonging um, in the country and why is that? And, and so I've been doing a lot of reading uh, about a um, uh, sense of belonging, um, particularly in British Columbia. And some of the things that have been pointed out to me are kind of interesting. The, the rate at which um, uh, like the percentage of the population that lives in a condo 
in Vancouver, for instance, is the highest in North America. And people who live in condos have smaller social networks. They don't interact with each other. They, 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 they walk around in tunnels and in trains and um, uh, they go into their apartments. They don't have a lawn to look after. They probably don't have a pet or they're less likely to have a pet. They have smaller families. Um, so that leads to smaller social networks. Um, one of the other um, uh, points that was made in a, a report that Alex sent to me was um, that Vancouverites were the first and the biggest adapters of social media in North America. So you guys all have, at least the ones in the room here, <laughs> y'all have um, lots of Facebook friends and Twitter, big Twitter feeds, and, and, and those are all kind of artificial connections, right? You don't have deep connections with with many of those people, and I read a newspaper article the other day, and something like only 97% of your friends on Facebook um, are people that you don't really interact with, you don't have a deep connection with. So it looks like on paper you all have not lots of friends and connections, but in reality they're not very strong. Um, and then um, uh, Adrian Clarkson has been uh, ruminating on this as well. Um, and uh, she talks about how new communication technologies allow us to keep track of one another. It's great, right? I can, I can talk to my mom every day on the phone because she doesn't live near me. Um, and, and I can talk to friends around the world every day. I can Skype with them for free. I can do that but it doesn't deepen my connection with the community in which I'm living in. And so I'm wondering if that's not one of the reasons that that's happening here too. Um, and then there's this issue with the discrimination uh, numbers. They're lower, which is great, fantastic. Although, I mean, still 20% of people in our sample are saying that they're discriminated against, which is way too many. Um, but I would expect that if the sense of belonging is, is not as good here, um, that the discrimination scores would be maybe a little bit higher. And so I'm still trying to put that together. So um, I do welcome any questions and suggestions you have because this all leaves me uh, with more questions than answers and I'm sure it does the same for you. So I'm going to encourage you to contact me, um, email me, uh, visit our website where we've got some reports. Uh, and uh, I'd like to thank you for listening to me for so long on, on a Thursday morning. Great. Thanks very much.